Okay, thank you very much, Mark, and uh, thank you very much, Stephen and Jody, for those great talks. Um, hello, everyone. How are you? Good. Um, I really appreciate you coming to my talk. Um, uh, let me get going, but before I do, oh, let me plug in my wireless presenter, otherwise it's going to get interesting. Okay. Um, before I get going, I just wanted to thank the um, sponsors, the local organizing committee, for all the work they've done and all the support that they've done to put on this uh, conference. Uh, I've been going to Phosphor G since about 2007. Uh, they're one of my favorite conferences of the year, and this is certainly no exception. Um, this venue in particular is just incredible. Uh, what an amazing room. So, uh, And thank you to all the speakers for sharing their time and expertise to make this a great conference. So, um, to introduce myself, I have to tell a little story. Um, I guess it's about a year ago now. I was in Washington, D.C. for a conference. And uh, during that conference, an interesting thing was happening. Uh, I went up to the roof of uh, the hotel that I was staying at because it had a, a rooftop pool each night. And uh, being a bit of an astronomy nerd that I am, I, I was aware that there was uh, a lunar eclipse happening. And so I got to both swim in the rooftop pool and watch the eclipse. And uh, as people also gathered on the, the rooftop um, sort of pool deck area, uh, they were all looking at the eclipse and talking about it. And uh, a few folks were sort of asking, saying, what, what's causing that? What's, 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 what, what, what is it that does that? And so I just sort of listened carefully and you know, nobody was really answering it. And so I said, well, you know, I'm a bit of an astronomy nerd. I wouldn't mind talking. And, and so I basically told them uh, about lunar eclipses. And uh, they were like, well, thank you very much. And they said, your, your accent. Uh, you're not from around here. Uh, I said, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm from Ottawa, Canada. And um, they said, oh, that's interesting. Well, what is it that you do? And so that was when it got a little bit funny and awkward because I said, oh, um, I work for the Eclipse Foundation. <laughs> and so the lifeguard immediately, his eyes went wide and he said, this is you? And, you know, this, there's times when you realize you're human. Um, I just wasn't quick enough to do what my colleague was suggesting. So my colleague was like, you should have said, yes, and you're welcome. <laughs> um, I said, no, no, and so I sort of explained a little bit more. So, um, so that's a little bit about um, where I work. Now, the Eclipse Foundation is uh, a not-for-profit organization. So you've heard uh, Jody and, and Stephen sort of talk about uh, not-for-profit foundations and the kinds of things that they can do to help uh, open source projects and organizations using open source. So that's uh, really the Eclipse Foundation's mission is to help uh, open source projects grow and, th and thrive and help companies who are building products and services around uh, open source uh, be successful and sort of you know, grow their business over time. Um, at the Eclipse Foundation, I'm personally responsible for two interesting groups. So the Location Tech Working Group, which is the GIS, Geospatial Geomatics Group, and also the Science Working Group, uh, which is doing sort of uh, tools for scientific uh, research, um, and it really spans the gambit. We have uh, nuclear simulation, we have synchrotrons, we've got you know uh, many, many different things in between. Some of the common threads are sort of data analysis, uh, visualization, modeling, you know, these kinds of things. Now, Eclipse um, is quite a large community. It's got about 300 open source projects and uh, 1,200 software developers and um, a very large number of member companies, I believe, are somewhere around 250, a little north of 250. Now, to make sense of all this, we have working groups. We're sort of uh, communities within the larger community. So the ones I mentioned, the IoT group, there's an automotive group and many more. So if you're interested in the, about this, pop by our booth and I'd be glad to chat with you. So um, this talk that I'm doing today, much of my career I did um, technical talks, sort of explaining technologies and how to use them uh, and these kinds of things, or trying to build uh, sort of uh, consensus around how things should work from an architecture perspective. This talk, um, we'll see how well this works. I'm going to try to tell a series of stories and see, see if it goes well. So the first story I want to tell, uh, I was at home one day and my partner and my older daughter um, had gone out somewhere running an errand. My younger daughter was with me, and so the usual protocol, I said, well, listen, I'm going to go um, do some things, and I was just basically telling her I was going to go have a shower, and if you, you know, don't answer the door, if you need something, let me know, because she's quite young. Um, and so I did, and about a minute or two later, I heard pounding on the, on the door, saying, Ma, Ma, come quick, come quick, it's, you know, uh, there's, there's fire, there's smoke, you know, come quick. So of course, you know, immediately whooshed out of the shower, sort of wrapped up as best I could, went down, and sure enough, there was uh, fire and smoke billowing out of the toaster. Now, 
you know, I put it out and then I sort of looked at her and said, what, what happened? Uh, and, and then she sort of muttered something and started trying to explain a little bit. And she said something about chocolate chips. And I'm like, what? And so uh, what had happened is she um, was quite interested in making something with chocolate chips. So she put some stuff in the toaster and then turned the toaster on. And of course, it did not go well. Um, and so uh, there's one aspect of uh, open communities and uh, open technologies that's quite useful is that, you know, if you don't have experience with something at first, whether it's a technical concept, you know, for a particular technology or, or running open communities or, you know, facilitating uh, commerce around open technologies, uh, you can run into trouble. So in this particular case, um, a little bit of guidance up front would have avoided, you know, this, this fire or potentially could have been far, far worse than that. Um, I want to tell another story. So um, I'm on this side of the pond, so I'll call it football. Um, my older daughter uh, plays, f plays football, in fact has for a while, and I noticed that when she was young, her and her friends would grab the ball, go out on the front lawn, and start playing. And um, it, it's actually really interesting watching young children play football because they don't really have a good concept of the, of the, the rules and sort of um, um, how they play is very organic and they pick up the ball with their hands and they laugh and sort of uh, it's a very, it's a very um, uh, unstructured game. Now, of course, as she got into the sports leagues, it's first with the community centers, then with the school, and then, you know, more formal things, um, the, the rules became more well-defined, more strict, um, and certainly at the higher levels, there's referees, and in fact, there's tournaments, there's even more sort of protocol and rules built on top of that and governance of how decisions are made. And so, again, this relates back to open source and open communities, is that um, you can put code up on GitHub, or actually, in fact, you can just put code up on any old uh, website, and um, uh, it'll be open code, but the difference between that open code and actually building a thriving open community around it are all the things like you know, governance and infrastructure and support that uh, are required to do that. Um, one more story, and this is not one I can take credit for. Um, at the university that I went to, um, all students were required to take uh, an introductory sci uh, psychology course. And um, the professor I had, his name was Dan McIntyre, was just phenomenal. And one of the stories he told one day, he was talking, uh, I forget what, specifically what concept he was trying to explain, but the this, this story I think is pretty self-evident. So he was talking about um, an experiment that happened many, many years ago where they had chimpanzees in an enclosure. And they wanted to sort of test intelligence and, and sort of social interaction and these kinds of things. And so what they did is they suspended a banana uh, high uh, above the enclosure. And they had a, um, a few things in the enclosure. They had a box and they had a stick and they had a few other things. And so sure enough, it didn't take long that one of the very, very smart and clever uh, chimpanzees basically put the box uh, down and then stood on the box with a stick and whacked the banana to knock it down. Uh, and so, you know, had his prized banana in his hand, and and just a, you know a few seconds later, the other chimpanzees beat the crap out of him and took the banana. Um, so another aspect of uh, open communities is that there's you know there's there's no HR department, and so uh, some of the norms and in fact some of the, the formal structure around code of conducts and these kinds of things are very important to try to make sure that our communities don't sort of degenerate into um, might makes right and sort of the person with the thickest skin wins, uh, and so this is another aspect uh, of open communities. So. Um, one of the co really cool things about the organization that I work for, and I've also been involved in OSGO for a very long time, since about 2007, uh, one of the great things about these organizations is they try to provide various aspects of supporting the community. So um, sometimes they're, they're a little bit informal and sometimes they're very formal, uh, but the idea is basically to provide that structure uh, for the community to help it thrive and be successful. And in fact, in some cases, it's, it's to not uh, unduly limit it, uh, its growth potential. Um, so uh, these are just a number of things. So uh, intellectual property management, sort of legal support to uh, scan code and talk about trademarks and you know these kinds of things and copyright. Um, you know, development process. So how do people make decisions in the project? How do people add new committers? You know, these kinds of things. Uh, I'm not going to read all of these, but uh, these are some of the important ones. And of course, uh, the central point of governance is how do we make decisions? You know, how do we sort of resolve conflicts? How do we, you know, um, um, sort of sort out where we're going over time? And, and, and in the absence of something written down, in the absence of any kind of governance, governance, it's kind of made up as we go. And that can be 
okay for a while, but as communities grow and thrive and become bigger and more successful, it, the, the need for reasonably well-structured and written down governance becomes, becomes quite apparent. Um, so what I do, I mentioned I work for the Eclipse Foundation, is um, I'm open source Tinkerbell. Uh, so I run around and try to keep everything in balance, uh, both from an open source project perspective, but also from an organizational perspective and company perspective. Um, so we have a number of different organizations who are large and small, uh, academic interests, commercial interests, government interests, and trying to make sure that's all in balance, that no, no one side has sort of too much power and influence and doesn't run away with it. Uh, and so my role is to sort of try to help just as much as is needed and then generally stay out of the way as much as I possibly can. Uh, so it's, it's very cool and it's, um, it's a role that I, um, I'm deeply honored to, to perform for the community. So um, getting a little bit more into the meat and potatoes of my talk, um, and some of you who have heard me speak before, uh, I've talked about this in other talks as well. I actually think it's a very interesting concept. Um, this gentleman, Neil deGrasse Tyson, so some of you may know it from the Nova series, know him from the Nova series or Star Talk Radio or various other things. He's actually um, become much of a meme uh, on the on the internet uh, because of a lot of really smart things that he said and, and observations. So. Uh, one of the things he was talking about one day, and I think it was a video that I saw uh, online of this, is he's talking about what three things inspire people to do um, great work, great things. So things like building the pyramids or sending someone to the moon uh, or you know crossing the ocean and colonizing, although one might debate that there's a lot of negative associated with that, but just things that are really spectacular and epic. And so the three things, and he, he actually said there's three and only three. Um, one of them was basically uh, praise of a deity or royalty, um, and, and he quickly said, well, this is actually less relevant uh, because uh, these days uh, the difference in how governments are structured, the difference in so how societies are structured is not as important as it used to be, and so that's not a, not a huge factor in, in modern society. Another one is, more, is war, um, so uh, I don't need to really talk about that. You know, people, really smart people trying to figure out how to blow things up and kill a lot of people often you know, can drive innovation. That, that's true. But uh, even that, the, the data shows that we're actually becoming more and more peaceful. And so that's becoming less of a factor over time. And so uh, his point in his talk was basically coming to the promise of economic return and business um, being the, the most powerful and the most relevant one uh, today. So this is why um, I really enjoyed hearing Stephen's talk and a lot of the ideas that he was talking about sort of I'll, I'll pick up on and sort of build upon. Um, so I want to leave that with you, the, the notion of you know, what three things uh, motivate people. But I also want to explore it in a little bit more, more depth. And hopefully this will be kind of interesting. I'm trying to um, make this interactive. So what I'm going to do, we're going to talk about purpose um, and different aspects of purpose. And you, you'll see what I mean in a second. So for the following slides, I'm going to flash up one word. Uh, and hopefully that word is a very, very clear concept. And the purpose of this exercise is if you feel that that word, that concept is important to you and your loved ones, clap your hands. If you feel, <laughs> not yet, not yet. Uh, if you feel it's not important, then, uh, then boo. Okay, and we'll get a sort of a real-time democracy thing going on to see if these concepts are important, okay? Um, so the first one is safety. Okay, health. Prosperity. Fairness. Now, at this point, you're probably going, okay, what's she doing? Like, these are, these are things that everybody wants. Um, and, and, and to be honest, I kind of expected that would be the case, and that there's, a, there's a point to this. Uh, a few more. So, happiness. Um, education, although I should explain, um, maybe education is a little bit broad and vague, so I'm going to say curiosity. Or even better, maybe do really cool stuff. I noticed that got a little bit louder for do really cool stuff. Um, so uh, the point of all of these is these all feed into our purpose, you know, what it is we're trying to do uh, in, in this universe. And um, the interesting thing about purpose and, and sort of um, servicing those, those aspects of purpose is we would do them anyway, no matter what tools we use, no matter what community we belong in. Uh, these are basically the, the, the guiding concepts or principles that basically drive us. Now, I want to talk about passion. Um, so passion is sort of the energy and the gusto uh, in, in which we do things. And 
passion can really power and make things uh, go really well. So, I mean, this is a very passionate community. It's something I've long uh, admired and respected. And in fact, you know, uh, I bring a lot of passion to the things that I do as well. Now, the concept I want to leave you with is the notion of linking passion with purpose. So if you have a, a very clear purpose, let's just say, uh, let's pick um, cli- uh, uh, environmental stewardship. So whether that's climate change, whether that's pollution, you, you can pick you know, what, what's important about uh, environmental stewardship that's important to you. Uh, if you have a very clear goal that you're trying to accomplish and you've got um, uh, passion to drive you to do things towards that goal, uh, it's very clear and it's very focused and you can have a very positive effect both in the short term and in the long term and good things can happen. Now, an interesting thing happens is you have lots of passion, but you take away purpose and suddenly the purpose becomes unclear. Um, suddenly that passion can become very negative because it can cause all kinds of damage that you're, you know people are passionate about things. Uh, and you think about this, like wars are caused by this and conflict is, is caused by this because people are very passionate and maybe they've lost focus on the specific purpose that maybe they actually do have common interest uh, between um, uh, them and other other parties and, and interests. So, so in an open community, it's, uh, it's really interesting to try to tie back to purpose. Why are we doing what we do? And what's the end goal that we're trying to accomplish? And it allows us to keep focused and um, have that be a very positive thing, both in, both in the short term and the long term. Now, I mentioned butter in my title, so I'm going to come back to butter. And at this point, you're probably wondering, what the heck is she talking about? How on earth can you bring butter into open source? And you're probably thinking I'm going to talk about the Internet of Cows, that uh, there are dairies out there that uh, trick out the cows with a harness that has basically an embedded system uh, with Wi-Fi and uh, the ability to communicate in a series of sensors in the cow's gut and uh, other places to be able to, be able to monitor the cow. Um, and there's uh, additional ones where they're basically using other sensors uh, in the fields and in fact and sometimes aer- aerial to uh, monitor the herd where they're traveling and these kinds of things. Um, This is really, really really cool, and actually I love the term Internet of Cows. Uh, If you haven't heard my colleague uh, Stephen Liang talk, he does a really amazing talk uh, talking about these things. He's an expert on Internet of Things and and the work that he's doing there at Sensor Hub is awesome. Now, um, it turns out there is an organization. uh, I I Google searched uh, open source dairy, I think at one point, and there is an organization that does this. And it's quite neat how there basically there's a, a series of dairies around the world that are sort of sharing best practice and concepts and these kind of things. Uh, this is also really super cool, and I'm glad to see how um, uh, open collaboration t- uh, uh, concepts have basically been pervasive elsewhere in society. Um, this is really uh, awesome and interesting, but it's actually not what I'm going to be talking about. Um, what I want to talk about is just sort of to try to use a metaphor that uh, butter, if you've done cooking, and I'm sure many of you have, uh, is a very common staple ingredient in a lot of things. So, you know, cakes and sauces and, you know, baking and, you know, these kinds of things. So uh, a lot of things are, frankly, made better by butter. Um, uh, I didn't say bacon. I said butter, but bacon is often referred to as a really positive thing as well. Now, the same concept applies to software. Um, that uh, how many people have heard the term software is eating the world? Not many in this audience. I'm surprised by that. So um, a gentleman named Mark Andreessen, uh, he's a venture capitalist now, but he was the gentleman who uh, was heavily involved with creating Netscape and a lot of other significant internet technologies early in the day. Uh, He wrote, I think it was a Wall Street Uh, journal article at one point, or it might have been a blog that got picked up and syndicated everywhere, but he was talking about how software is eating the world, and at the time it was a a big thing for a lot of people, but it really resonated strongly with me. Um, And and so I'm going to try to relay it to you in a way, uh, not the same words, but hopefully the concept will come across, is that uh, these days there are many organizations that are heavily, heavily into software, and software is, they're dependent on software, but they weren't a software company. So if you think about it, um, uh, a, a grocery store or a hairstylist or, you know, uh, a number of these organizations basically depend upon software and, in fact, almost have to be maybe maybe not necessarily full-fledged developers, but certainly sort of IT integrators to get their systems to work properly, or at least have that capacity in-house. And that certainly wasn't the case in the past. And so software has become per- pervasive in all aspects of society. Now, what's interesting is that uh, open source software is similar, that under the covers in a lot of 
uh, prominent organizations uh, just splashing up a few logos. I could put up probably easily a few hundred more uh, where these organizations are ba basing their products and systems on top of open components. Now, the whole system is not necessarily strictly open from top to bottom, but certainly the, the open components play a very big role there. Uh, and I find that quite interesting. Now, I want to build upon that. Um, how many of you have read Isaac Asimov's Foundation series? Some okay, a good number. Yes, it's a pretty geeky audience. So that's 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 good to see. If you haven't read it, actually, it's it's fascinating, especially when you read it from beginning to end. I find it incredible that one brain could string all that together in these concepts and just have such a brilliantly crafted story. So it's similar to reading things from Tolkien and Frank Herbert and you know these kinds of things. And so one concept from the Foundation series is the notion that uh, society is very fragile and brittle. That um, not many people really have the knowledge to maintain all the systems that society depend, depends upon. So uh, I don't want to put spoilers in, in, uh, for those who haven't read uh, Foundation yet, but it's quite interesting. So, but the, the key thing is, um, in today's world, uh, when software systems don't work, um, we have a really bad day. So you, you're, you can't, you're the flight, the, uh, there was, uh, I think it was Delta Airlines not long ago, had a software glitch and it completely grounded the airliner all around the world. Um, that's not unusual. Or I've seen stores where basically they had a software glitch uh, in their cash register system and they completely, the, the store couldn't do business for that day until they fixed the software problem. And so this is not surprising to many of you. I'm sure you, you, you will relate. Many of you are actually developing systems that feed into these types of technologies. So um, there's a data aspect to that as well, that without the data, um, the software is largely meaningless. And so what's interesting is that our systems are now generating data for other systems. And so the whole thing is uh, growing quite dramatically. I, you know, I think it's safe to say it's growing exponentially. I don't actually have concrete data right in front of you to show, say, that in all aspects of data generation in society, you know, data is growing exponentially. But I, it, intuitively, I think, I think you'll agree with me that that makes sense. And so this is a little chart I was trying to uh, create a little while ago to try to convey a concept is that um, I've been doing uh, technology and computing for more than 20 years. And what I've noticed is a trend both in two directions on this axis. So going from uh, batch processing data, so basically we can take data and crunch it for a while, figure out what, what it's telling us, and then produce a report and sort of respond to it. And it could take days or weeks or months, but it's, it's not necessarily re real time, whereas these days people expect real time. You know, and you think about it, I want to know the traffic right here, right now. I don't need to know the traffic four hours ago. That's irrelevant to me. I need to know it right here, right now. Same thing with weather, same thing with you know, other aspects of, of data that we interact with every day. Um, and the same thing, the interactions with the data are complex. So it's not just um, you consuming the data, it's you're actually actively participating in sharing your data back into the system, whether the system is monitoring you as you travel through on traffic networks or other things. Now, as software and data systems are becoming so pervasive and woven into the fabric of our everyday lives, uh, these things become really, really, really crucial. Now, what's interesting is that no one company, no one government, no one organization can solve these things. It actually has to be, by its very nature, very pluralistic and very participative. Uh, and so this, in my opinion, there's no other way to solve these, these difficult, challenging problems than open, open collaboration. Now, um, I talked about some of the organizations earlier. You know, why do why do they use open technologies, and and how do they accomplish things? You know, using open collaboration and open technologies. Um, this picture, sort of uh, at, at a glance, how that happens is that people com collaborate often around the commodity bits, the things that they need to do but aren't necessarily a source of competitive advantage, and then they try to compete on unique value add built on top. Now, to get between the two, there's often sort of glueware and, and additional software and technology and know-how to get to get you there. But uh, this is a very, very common model. Now, I, you remember I talked about uh, some of the, the things like governance and infrastructure and legal support and these things. These are very important to have right because um, as, as Jody was mentioning in his talk, if you don't have them right, you're going to throw a wrench in the process that suddenly people want to build things on your technology and they just can't or, you know, or something unexpected happens. So getting that right is very, very important to avoid hindering and inhibiting growth uh, within your community and your ecosystem. Uh, another idea I want to share with you is um, a big chunk of my, my early career, I worked in a large telecom company. And I, I marveled at how hard it was to collaborate 
um, with our hardware manufacturers and some of the some of the people who provided software systems. So collaborating across large organizations was very difficult. Often you had to go up the organization uh, to somebody senior enough to talk to the person, somebody senior at the other organization, and back down again. And the cycle time for those conversations was extremely slow and, and very difficult. And in fact, in fact, um, I don't know what you call it, but in, in, in Canada where I'm from, in, in Ottawa, we call it the telephone game, where one person says something to another person who repeats it to another person and repeats, repeats it to another person. And it's often quite humorous that the message after you pass it through enough people becomes completely garbled and doesn't resemble the original message. And so that process I found was very problematic. And, and that's what kind of drove me and, and attracted me to, to uh, open, open communities, open source, and open collaboration. And so what's neat about um, op open collaboration is you create almost a virtual organization where engineers from different organizations come together. And what I've noticed, uh, and this is really kind of an interesting social phenomenon, is often the engineers working on uh, that open project identify much more strongly with their colleagues on that project than their colleagues back at their home company, uh, which is really quite interesting to see. Uh, and a good thing, of course. Now, to build on uh, some ideas that Stephen was talking about, who's writing code, uh, something that I've often been quite interested in. Uh, I was very fortunate to be part of the team who organized PhosphorG North America um, uh, in, in Raleigh, North Carolina in May. Uh, it was a great conference uh, for many reasons. Um, one of the things that we did was a survey of, attend of attendees. And uh, one of the questions we asked them was basically, um, what brought them there? And uh, so we, we, we had simple answers, basically, that you know, their work brought them there, their research and studies, um, you know, these kinds of, or sort of volunteer hobby. And the data, as you can see uh, over my shoulders, uh, was overwhelming that um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a FOSS conference, but everybody is there for, for work reasons, which is kind of what you'd intuitively expect, but maybe not what um, sort of the mythos for, for uh, open communities talks about, that, that there's sort of this myth that people are doing it just out of the goodness in their heart and volunteering. Now, uh, as Stephen said, that is a wonderful thing when people do that and should be praised and recognized and you know these kind of things. But what's interesting is the data shows that, uh, by and large, it's... Um, it's, it's work that's basically driving people to these conferences. Um, another, another thing that I thought was quite interesting was just to see, are people using strictly open technologies, strictly closed technologies, or um, a mix of open and closed? And the data in that case showed overwhelmingly that uh, people are fairly pragmatic. So there were some people who were strictly open technologies, and there were some people who were strictly closed. Uh, but for the most part, the, the vast, vast majority were um, using a hybrid mix of open and closed. So referring back to what I was saying earlier, that no one company can solve these problems, and you know, um, it's, it's very true. And no one open source project and no one open community can solve these problems either. We need to work together. Otherwise, things don't work the way that we need them to. So. Um, so another interesting one was asking people um, who paid for their ticket. And um, again, overwhelmingly, uh, their employer did. So there were a few, a few sort of self-funded folks, and there were some scholarships, there were some free speaker passes and these kinds of things. But um, the vast, vast majority were basically people who were, were paid to go to the conference and participate in the conference for, uh, based on their employer, um, which, is, which is really interesting. So now let me double back and talk about butter. Um, generally, in anything you do, uh, friction is something that slows things down, makes it difficult, uh, makes it hard. Uh, open collaboration, for a number of reasons I talked about, you know, having that single culture, having that single understanding of how to do things, single set of sort of legal documents and governance uh, around that sort of virtual organization that is an open source project or an open community, uh, just makes things a lot easier. And so by reducing friction and making it easier for people to work together and build on the ideas of others, um, the, the concept and sort of the genesis for this talk was looking at uh, open collaboration, sort of digital butter, butter. It makes things sort of smoother and easier and also makes things sort of taste better, better and have a more positive experience. And so just to start wrapping up, um, I'll go back to the metaphor of butter, you know, fairly hard. Is the, so what does this mean? What do you take away from this? And, and I'm really echoing a lot of the things that Stephen said is, you know, support the, the farmer, support the people who are developing those open technologies that you're using and benefiting from. Uh, try to, you know, pay for support, pay for subscription, pay for the services. Uh, you, I mean, it's, if you're not able to, then great. You know, learn the technologies and learn how to use them yourself. But if you are in a position to do so, uh, supporting it financially, supporting it with time and contribution is really significant to the community. 
um, consider becoming yourself, you're a farmer yourself one day. So consider uh, bringing open source projects uh, out into the open. Consider bringing them to a foundation. Consider growing a community around it. Uh, this is what helps drive uh, innovation and invention, as uh, uh, Ivan was talking about earlier in the day. Um, recognize that uh, good butter helps us pursue our purposes. So we, we would all do the things we're going to do, whether or not we have amazing, slick, automated uh, digital technologies. We would do them on paper if we had to. We would get we would get it done. Uh, but actually, having better tools to do the things we're doing is actually it makes things easier and faster and better and more efficient. Um, I do want to uh, hopefully leave you with a lasting impression that passion without a clear purpose or passion with n not linked strongly to purpose can be a very dangerous thing. Uh, and I hope you'll agree with me on that and help you know to sort of uh, follow that practice in in, in your lives as well. And then uh, the last thing I'll say is um, I'd love to hear what you're doing. One of the best things about conferences is learning about the amazing things and the amazing work that people are doing. Uh, so please uh, come by to chat. I'm pretty easy to spot. Um, I, we also have a, a location tech booth, so I'll be hanging out there a lot. And I'd love to hear what you guys are working on. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for listening to my talk. And I'd like to thank uh, the organizers again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Is he on? He is on. Uh, it's on. Uh, are there any questions uh, for Andrea? None. None whatsoever. I'm standing between you and lunch, so. Okay. Um, can I thank all three speakers, Jody, Stephen, Andrea, for their beautiful expose of how to sort of uh, join the dairy. Uh, work hard to earn your bread and butter it uh, whichever way you want, but also with a purpose. Thank you very much. Have a great conference.